And we do that every day because what we learned yesterday was yesterday's learning, and today's a new day in the dojo. It's a new day in the school of life, and a new day in the market. So every day you got to bring that sensibility and be mindful and embrace the opportunity to learn. And so if uh, Anthony were here and if he's listening to this video, like he should be, uh, we would talk about principles, and there are many in sustainment and tactics and strategy, but the, uh, as a logistician, my job is to support the combat soldier. I have to be responsive, which means I get the right stuff to the right time, to the right person, and the right priority, and the right quantity, so they can fight and win. That's being responsive. Well, to be responsive to the market, to fight and win in trading, I got to be responsive to do all those things. Well, that briefs well. What's that actually mean, though? Well, to get responsiveness, I need three things anticipation, integration, and simplicity. As a logistician, I have, to, I have trucks that are slower than combat vehicles, which can go off road and go through mud, and I can't. So I'm driving slower fuel trucks on roads and he's faster than me so I got to anticipate where the requirements would be so I can get there on time and meet him at the moment of need. So that means I have to forecast and have scenario plan to figure out what's got to be done. I got to figure out what the risks are and account for it. So anticipation is knowing my business and figuring out what the future might hold and having a plan that can adapt and succeed no matter what happens. And when I anticipate and come up with a plan, then I've got to integrate that into all the other plans and things that I'm doing and the operations I'm supporting or whatever task I'm doing that's in support of another task. I can get the timing right on all that. So integration really means that I've got to be a whole person, an entire operation working together the way you know, our bodies work. Um, so integration, after I've anticipated and sorted out, then I've got to integrate, and then I've got to simplify so that I have a fighting chance of getting things done. Reducing the complexity in execution. I may have been very complex in planning and exhaustively detailed in preparation, but when it comes time to execution, I want to render that down to be as simple as possible, the fewest moving parts. I want to be the wedge. I want to be the simplest tool known to man, the inclined plane. So we had a guy in the shop that used to, that was his nickname was the wedge because he really was the simplest tool known to man, but he got things done. You can't, it's, it may be too heavy to lift directly straight up, but you put that on an inclined plane and now you reduce the resistance and effort that it takes to move. And the heavier it is, the the smaller the angle of incline so that you can, yeah, and just overcome the friction coefficient, now you can use that tool to get the, oh, you can build pyramids with the incline plane. That's how they put it. So, to be responsive and adapt, I gotta anticipate, integrate, and simplify. We gotta stay focused with eyes on the prize, always knowing what we're about, why we're doing that thing, what the end state should be, and not be distracted by the trivial many, so that we can focus on the most important few. So Miyamoto Masashi, who was the uh, greatest Japanese swordsman ever, who was 62 and 0 in uh, sword fights to the death, all honorable, all volunteer on both sides. Uh, he was 62 and 0. And his book, The Book of Five Rings, gives advice on living and advice on swordsmanship. And bullet point number nine from Musashi is, do not engage in useless activities. And in the Hagakure, the Japanese samurai philosophy manual, it says, the samurai can make all important life decisions within the space of seven breaths maybe seven heartbeats and seven breaths. And what that means is that by keeping your eyes on the prize and knowing what is most important, that you're never far from how to make a decision when the environment presents a trigger, a new information, and you immediately run it through your criteria of what's most important to you, 
that you need to be able to, within the space of seven heartbeats, figure out what needs to be done, then commit to it and do it. If it takes you more than seven heartbeats or seven breaths to figure out what's going on and what it means overall, maybe you were too far from your center and were worried about the trivial details and didn't have a way to stay connected to first principles and values and identity. And so focus eyes on the prize. That's the visual cortex, but it's also sort of values-based living and being aligned with the most important things for you. The idea of perfect practice, meaning that you don't get to choose the opponent all the time um, or the time and place, but what you can do is control how you practice, how hard you practice, what you practice on, the techniques you use to maximize the learning opportunity and your commitment to getting better. In practice, in the soccer team, we say, um, you play the game for fun and joy and to discover what it is that you need to work on. And you give thanks to the referee and the other team for helping you discover what you need to work on. And if you keep beating everybody and it's too easy, maybe you should be working on finding better opponents and stop kidding yourself. Keep looking for the next best challenge. Or if they beat you, you respect them, figure out what they did really well and learn from that and have the commitment and practice to get on with it. And if you can get past the ego of winning and losing and focus on a journey of continuous improvement and self-expression, then you don't try to hide what you don't know. You advertise what you don't know to your trusted others so that they can offer to help and that you can get past your own ego and be a person who can accept help and offer help to others within the limits of what you know and offer humbly and gratefully. And forgive me for the advice I'm about to give. So gratitude and forgiveness keeps coming back. And so um, perfect practice really means that we're bringing that mindful effort and in preparation, we get to decide who we are. And in the games, we discover, hey, how's it going compared to others? What do we need to work on? So perfect practice, that preparation, really is important. So when you hear me talk about plan, prepare, execute, and assess as that continuous cycle of trading and learning, the plan is just coming up with a number of ideas so that we always have something favorable to do depending what the environment's gonna show us, right? It just has to be good enough to give me good things to work on. So a pretty good plan is plenty. Preparation is the most important thing because it's here where I get all the detailed work in it and uh, rehearsals and equipment and, and contingency uh, rehearsals and, and uh, battle drills and getting the resources just so, refining my SOPs and my battle drills. And then when it comes to execution, it should be very easy. I have many things planned and all of them prepared. And when the environment gives me the particular signal that it was going to give me, then I simply execute according to the plan. Uh, and I'm not thinking about it. I'm just executing the carefully developed and reverse battle for a plan. That's where my edge is. And then if I survive, what's even more important in preparation is the assessment. Because the plan prepared, execute, and results was simply one iteration in a long series of transactions and case studies. And if I'm ever going to get better on those ones in the future, I must assess how well I planned, prepared, and executed, and do the five feedbacks, and what can I do to get better? The reason the Patriots are so successful is because they assess and then prepare better than anybody. They diagram every play of every game. They look to see what every player does on every play and integrate it, look for themes and contingencies and habits and patterns and put it all together and so they are prepared because of their assessment. So if you survive your <laughs> plan, prepare, and execute and get the results, the assessment is how you figure out how to improve each one of those. You can even assess your assessment 
and get better at that. So it's very meta in that sense. This is the most important part. And you must be the strictest judge of your own performance because you are responsible for the thing that will make you the best, which is your assessment of how well you are planning, preparing, and executing. So if I spend time on that, rather than on the little details of systems and signals and all that, that's why. Because this is the technology that allows us, the tool, that allows us to have a spirit of continuous improvement based on statistics and math, that's an edge, and then the spirit of gratitude and forgiveness documented in learning journals is how we improve that judgment. So staying alert and managing risk, that's how you don't get eaten. Because when you think you're stalking your target, who's stalking you? you know? How do you catch tigers? You put out a goat and the tiger is stalking the goat so that you can stalk the tiger. But when you think you're stalking the tiger, you might want to look around a little bit. The, you won't even see him. You, it's like you can't even track or stalk a tiger. I mean, you just hope that he misses. He's going to get the first shot, unless you know you're some you're very lucky or he's sick. Hmm. Uh, so staying alert, managing the risk, all of these things together lead us to an ecosystem of learning. In order to develop this professional judgment, so that's what I wanted to say about where we ended up at the last base camp and the and the takeaway points of what we really wanted to seal in and lock it in. So that's you know uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you and I'm going to tell you what I told you. I just told you what I'm going to tell you. That's sort of the, the baseline. This is a natural point to ask you. How are we doing so far? Doing all right? Yeah. yeah. Really good. Can I make a comment about what you do this kind of, Sure. Something that's kind of it's kind of occurred to me over time. The conventional way of looking at forgiveness is you did this to me, but I forgive you. And there's some sort of inherent uh, superiority in that. Yeah. I'm the better person. Exactly. You know. Maybe what the uh, what the real meaning of forgiveness is is I see the action, but I look through it because it's not really there, and I see yeah. the same manifestation, the same person that I am. Yeah. And you see them, for, and you see them for who they are. And it's the next, and the forgiveness is not given so much as. Well, we get on with the next thing, the next best thing to do. We maybe acknowledge that happened. Yes. We're not going to forget it because the the universe remembers everything. So forgive and forget really means I forgive you, but I'm not going to hold that against you in, in terms of you know retribution. I'm going to still try to do the best, the next best thing, whatever that may be. But there's no forgetting. In the, in the universe. The market remembers everything, and the price records everything, and it's always there. If you, the karmic wheel, you're advancing or retreating, you're never just standing still because the world is moving around you. You're either going along with it, or you're falling behind, or you're kind of leading the way and pulling it in this direction. So, I think the way so forgiveness is almost like an, it's, um, it's the acknowledgement that that just happened but not the acceptance. And, 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 and I don't accept that that is okay and that's what it's going to be. And, and never mind, it didn't matter. Everything matters if you believe everything's connected and it's part of the grand story. Everything matters. So it's the, um, the action towards the next better thing is one of the ways that you demonstrate maybe the, um, uh, the authenticity of the forgiveness or the depth of the forgiveness is the willingness to continue to get better together from wherever we are. To say, well, that just happened, I acknowledge that, so now what are we going to do together? Yes. Now if we just can't get along and do better together, well, 
then whatever's going to happen next happens next. But at some point, you know, I think of, uh, we talk about uh, four kinds of problems, skill, will, imagination, and resourcing. Each one of them has their own strategy on how to fix it. If it's a skill problem, then I just got to teach you the skill. I know how to do that. And so this is kind of an army flavor here. Uh, if it's a will problem, like the guy knows what to do and knows how to do it, but won't do it because of an intention, I know what to do there too. So I don't confuse skill problems from will problems entirely different set of strategies and actions that are going to happen efficiently and decisively. A lack of imagination, though, it could be that you look at the guy and he doesn't know what to do, although you know that he has the skills and you can see the solution and he just hasn't made that connection between the current state and the future state and how to get around that problem. He doesn't even realize 